people started saying to me, what have you done, Jen Mack? You're so different. I can't put my finger on it. I grew up in a time where you didn't talk about the chaos. You know, today yeah. everybody throws their chaos on social media, which <laughs> I think has its I think it has its pluses and its minuses. I'm not judging. So when I show up, nobody says anything. They're just like, hey, Jen, nice to see you. <laughs> not like, way to go. You're amazing that yeah. you got here. Way to be here. Yes. Yeah. I could do a three hour podcast with you. Uh, and then I would you love it. To shut <laughs> up because I have so much to say. But. Guys, I'm super excited for this next guest to join us for the Ripple Effect podcast. Jen Mack is someone that I've been following on Twitter or X or whatever we're calling it these days uh, since last year. And I know the algorithm knows what it's doing because it put her in my path because I needed it. Her little uh, shot in the arm of inspiration that she puts out with her posts, her positivity, her uh, unique spin on certain things is just really, it always brings a smile to my face. And so you know me, I couldn't help but ripple my way to her and let her know how much I appreciated what she was doing in the world, the rippler that she is. And of course, I had to invite her on the Ripple Effect podcast. You can learn more about her at jen-mac.com. She is a life coach, a keynote speaker, and she is just a lightning rod of positivity. I think you're going to love her. I can't wait for you to meet her. So let's dive right in. Guys, I am super excited to have Jen Mack join us for the Ripple Effect podcast. Jen, welcome. How are you doing today? I'm great, Steve, and thank you so much for asking me to be on today, your podcast. I uh, I was excited as soon as I learned a little bit about you and your mission. I think there's a lot of synergy between uh, the two of us and our work, so I'm happy to be here and appreciative. Well, I, I got to say, I, I said it in your intro, I have followed you for a while, and it, and it took a lot of courage to reach out to you, but I, I often do these things called rippling out to people, right? And you are so kind and so gracious, and then we got on a call and I'm like, I just knew um, our our folks needed to know you because you're, you're, number one, the things that really resonate with me about what you do on social media is you are so positive. There's so much negativity out there. And there are other people that try to put their positive spins out there, but you kind of see like the inconsistency. You are consistent. You always make me think. You always bring a thought to my mind. And often I'm always smiling. And so I want you to know the ripples that you're creating out there in the world, they're needed and they're appreciated. Well, thank you for that. I'm happy to hear that because, um, you know, I feel strongly we're each here to contribute our gifts to the world. And uh, yeah, I, 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 any, anything I can do to make the world a little better today, a little brighter um, is my aim. So thank you for those kind yeah. words. Well, I would say you're hitting the target without question. So one of the things that I want, want to start off with is I'm a big believer in kind of understanding someone's origin story. Like, how did you become the awesome Jin Mac that you are? So can you give us a little bit of your background? Well, that's very funny, Steve. I'm happy to give some of my background. And I always say I did not end up in this profession because I was the picture of mental health when I started on my journey. You know, in fact, it was really a lot of suffering and my own journey to heal my own self and my own life that then gave me the ability to pay it forward and help others. Um, you know, I always say to people, especially my clients, if um, I had known God, you know, source, the universe, whatever you choose to call it, had a bigger plan for me back when I was 20 something, crying myself to sleep every single night. Yeah. Um, if, if, if God had just whispered in my ear, hang in there, not only is your life going to transform, but you're going to be able to help thousands of women one day. I would have happily cried myself to sleep, but that was not the case. I didn't know, you know, there's a bigger plan. So for your listeners today, if that's helpful for anyone, I just want to share that because, you know, we all go through challenging times. It's part of being human. We all go through dark periods. Yep. And I really do believe that we just have to tie a knot and hang on and find our way through. And at the end, um, our journeys are never just about our, ourselves. It's really yeah. about somebody else crosses our path and then you go, oh, I know why that happened because now I can help this person. So my story of origin really is, you know, I always say it's that uh, a story of my insides didn't really match my outsides. I grew up in a beautiful home, two loving parents. I was well-educated. 
but there was also a lot of chaos in my home mm -hmm. growing up. And I grew up in a time where you didn't talk about the chaos. You know, today yeah. everybody throws their chaos on social media, which <laughs> I think has its I think it has its pluses and its minuses. I'm not judging anyone yeah. Yeah. because I know often how helpful that is. I'm just saying I grew up in a time where you don't talk about your problems. Um, I just remember having this knowing, like it was put in my heart or my soul that I just had to hang on. And, and as soon as I got out in the world, I had to find the wisdom and the tools and the skills um, to make life what I really felt in my heart it was meant to be. I didn't feel like, um, you know, the universe brings us here to suffer. Right. I, I really right. felt like we're here to um, positively create and continually positively expand and then pay it forward and help each other. I really felt, even as a young child, that's the journey. And I felt that there was just a lot of despair and anxiety and fear in the home I grew up in. And I just had to, as a child, hang on and then get out and learn what I could. And so that was really the journey. As soon as I got to NYU, I was struggling on every front. I always say it was the gift of desperation. Um, you know, it wasn't like I was struggling in one area, Steve. You know, I think that's sometimes why, um, you know, you can have a bottom early on is like, I was struggling everywhere. I, I couldn't, you know, I would see all these young girls um, have these great relationships with guys. You know, I would always have a guy attracted or interested, but then they'd run for the hills, like after three dates. I was just so desperate because I didn't love myself yet. You know, I didn't, I didn't know my own worth. So I couldn't um, kind of create any kind of loving relationship. I didn't know what I really wanted to do with my life. I had a tremendous amount of uh, anxiety and depression I was vacillating between. Um, it was just like I was, and, and then I was drinking a lot as a coping mechanism to deal with all these feelings and to try to turn the noise off in my head. And um, so I, I call it the gift of desperation, but I got on a path of personal development very young. Uh, at that time, NYU used to have like, I don't know if they still do this, I think like 10 or 15 free sessions on campus with the, this, you know, their psychiatrists. So uh, a friend had told me she went and it was very insightful. She used that word and it piqued my curiosity. Mm -hmm. So I went, they referred me off to a place called the Youth Counseling League. And I started to do therapy at 17 years young, which led me to getting sober um, through the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, and I'm still sober to this day. Good that has you. been a, a great gift in my life. 28 years I just celebrated in yeah, January. Yeah, congratulations. Uh, Thank you. And, and, and then I really spent the next decade healing my life. Every book out there, uh, you know, thankfully now all of this is much more mainstream back in the day, this was 1990, Steve. So yeah. you had to be very forward thinking. And thankfully I, I lived in New York city, which was always forward thinking and open-minded. So, you know, there was everything out there and I tried it all Reiki, every healing modality you can think of. Um, but I transformed my life over a decade and then People started saying to me, what have you done, Jen Mack? You're so different. I can't put my finger on it. And then they would share with me, because I was vulnerable, what they were struggling with. And then it was like as if the universe was using me, because when I would speak to people, all of a sudden, like a course that I took would pop up and this voice right here would say, tell them to take this course or a book would pop up or a phrase or I'd tell them to get this. So they call me later and say, I just had to follow up. This changed my life. Thank you so much. You need to teach a class, Jen Mac. That's and awesome. then I heard that for like three years. And finally I thought, okay, let me, let me give this a go. So I started with three girlfriends. The next Saturday, nine strangers showed up. And, you know, within a, a month or so, I think Rebecca Mead from, I never can remember if it was the New Yorker or New York magazine emailed me saying, I heard about these classes you're teaching. I'd love to interview you. And I totally panicked and said, no way, because, you know, I didn't know what I was doing yet. I was just kind of following this intuition I had to share the wisdom over 10 years that I had acquired with people also seeking. Um, but I took that as a huge God wink that I was onto something that was very needed. And, and then my business just grew word of mouth and I've been doing it 21 years now. So I feel very, very fortunate. And, um, my suffering was not for, for nothing, you know? I, I love it. And, and that probably makes you a better 
coach, a better teacher, a better mentor and inspirer in so many ways, because you've been there, you've put in the work, but not that other coaches don't obviously, but at the end of the day, you're the, what you are putting in front of the clients you work with is, is what really you use to heal yourself. And I think that is so amazing. Absolutely. I mean, I think, um, you know, there's a saying we have in recovery when you're working with people with addiction and, you know, it's always, um, what better person to help another addict or alcoholic than an alcoholic or addict who's been in recovery, who knows the exact path. And while no two people's paths are exactly ever the same, um, I think very much that is where my wisdom has come and my confidence in coaching and my success is, you know, I have walked many paths of transformation. I still am walking paths of transportation, uh, transportation, listen to me, transformation, <laughs> transportation, transformation, it's all the same thing. But We're all yes, going somewhere. I, yeah, yeah, <laughs> but I, I'm still, I'm still on that journey. I'm, I'm a voracious learner, Steve. Um, yep. And I really feel like my soul just always wants to grow and be better and do better. And so I feel that's also what has drawn my clients to me is, uh, you know, there's a saying in the 12 step program, like um, there's people who walk the walk and then people who walk the walk and talk the talk. Did I just get that wrong? Yeah. Like there's people that talk the talk, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. And then yep. there's people who talk the talk and walk the walk. And yep. I really do my very best. I'm not perfect by any stretch. No one is, but I really strive each day to wake up and um, you know, talk the talk and walk the walk. And yeah. that is definitely where my coaching comes from. You know, I love that. And, and, it, and it's so you can see it in your face, in your eyes, it pops that this is definitely what you're supposed to be doing. So I, I'm just, I'm just so grateful that our paths have crossed because, you know, we, I want to spread your message as far and as wide as we possibly can. I know your focus predominantly centers around women. And you and I talked about this offline. This is a really underserved arena and women really, uh, they often don't get the resources and the, the necessary services like coaching. Why do you think that is? And, and for someone out there that might be considering, you know, I, I definitely need something, you know, what is, you know, what is that about coaching that, you know, you want them to think about? Yeah, well, just to take it a step back, you know, just to start, I didn't intend to serve just women. Okay. I opened okay. up and started with wanting to serve men and women, but I could never get enough men together, Steve, for even <laughs> one group, you know? And so I'd have these like men. So through the years, I do want to, you know, say that I have worked with a few male clients. Um, they're usually uh, my female clients' spouses, and they're like, you need to work with Jen Mack. <laughs> I'm going to talk to her and they twisted my arm, but it was a great experience. Sure. So the only reason I never did, worked with men was I, there was never enough to this day to fill a yeah. group. And I always felt that to the other point, women, the reason I wanted women to, to be in groups of only women is women tend to shut down often yeah. in the presence of men. Um, and I wanted women to feel safe and secure and be able to speak their truth so they really could grow. And I think that is the case and why women are still, I mean, it's changed dramatically in the 21 years since I started coaching, but I think why women are still underserved is, I mean, let's be honest, it's still very much a man's world. Yeah. You know, uh, the last 2000 plus years, we are living in a patriarchal system and um, I think it has changed dramatically in an exciting ways. I think, um, you know, a lot of men understand that when we allow women to be on equal footing, we serve not just women, but ourselves and the whole yeah. planet. And yeah. I think, you know, I think everything we're seeing in the outer world, much of that has to do with the imbalance of the male and the female, the masculine Agreed. and the feminine. Yep. You know, male is the aggressive macho energy out in the world. We need that. That's productivity. That's aggression. You need some of that. But when you have so much of that and you don't have the female energy, which is surrender, by the way, surrender is not weak. Right. You know, surrender is power. It's like a magnet. Marion Williamson talks about this in her first book, A Return to Love. It's like the shavings of a magnet get drawn to the shaving, you know, to the, to the magnet. Um, 
that is the power of the feminine. It attracts, uh, it nurtures, it loves. And when we bring that back into balance, we see amazing things happen for yeah. men and for women. And I am just grateful for all the men on our planet, I'm sure yourself included, my husband, that understand the power of women. And when we allow women to soar in the same great heights, you know, to the same great heights that we allow men in our culture, wonderful things happen. Yeah. Um, and so that's really a wish I have too. Um, and, and, you know, to, to the point, um, when I started working, I worked with all types of women um, today, I, you know, as my work continued, I wanted to make greater impact. So when I looked back at the women I served, when I saw that I served other women like myself that were leaders in some way or doers, you know, just the action takers of the world, this work is action oriented. So you have to take action to change yeah. your life. Yeah. So when I worked with those women, they moved the needle the most, not only in their own lives, but for everyone in their small corner of the world. So I was like, oh, if I serve women that are doers and action takers, I can make a greater impact because then everyone in their small corner of the world all around the globe will look to them to want to be better and do better and grow themselves. But it's an interesting thing. I'm bringing this up because women often that I think are clear leaders do not perceive themselves as leaders. And I, I also like to widen the definition from the traditional definition to, um, you know, if you're a mother and you're listening right now, even if you're not in the workforce, you're a leader, you're leading young children lives. You know, if you run a household, you're a leader. Um, if you're volunteering in your community or at the PTA, you're a leader. Um, I've had clients that are clear leaders, like they're CEOs and they don't even think they're leaders. You know, it's insane though, how women often don't perceive, uh, themselves as powerful. And I think yeah. some of that, again, our conditioning and the fear for women to step into that, if that makes sense. It does. And you know, the thing that I find often when I talk to women about a coaching relationship or where they're wanting to go with their career. In fact, I had a conversation this morning is how quickly they are to dismiss their own needs. And when, when you actually think about the coaching relationship, um, the, the natural uh, pushback that you often get is, oh, sure, when am I going to have time? I have all these other responsibilities that I'm, I'm handling. And there is, uh, you know, um, whether it's the draw from the family or, or keeping up with the household or, you know, if, if they're career driven, you know, trying to just keep up and, and be able to show that they belong and, and, that drives me nuts for environments. I mean, it's, you know, we need to get over that, right? At the end of the day, I mean, women uh, need to, you know, uh, men need to recognize there are equals. There is no, you know, variance there. But when I was talking to this person this morning, she said, you know, I, I just have never thought about it. I said, well, do you go to the gym? Well, yeah, I go to the gym. And, you know, what do you, what do you do there to, you know, you know, why do you go to the gym, right? Well, I'm trying to stay healthy. I'm trying to keep balance. This is part of that self care that you deserve, right? With it's not just for CEOs of Fortune 500 companies. This is for anybody at any phase in their life who needs somebody else that can sort of identify where they are, are help them navigate those waters, and sort of guide them in the right direction. And the thing I want to point out to my listeners: if you hear Jen speaking, she doesn't say I coach; she says I serve. And that's what, that's always my sort of high watermark for an, ex, an exceptionally great coach is that they recognize they are helping serve a need. They are a vessel to helping drive, you know, someone's performance or personal, you know, uh, satisfaction driving, you know, some element of their life. And I love that about you because you can see it really just ooze from you when you're talking about it, why it's important work for you, why it's so critical. For your perspective though, um, what would you say to, you know, the, that, that, um, young woman that I was talking to this morning about why you need a coach. It's even more important for you to double down and make that investment in yourself. Yeah. I mean, listen, everyone on the planet could use a coach that yeah. is for certain. Yeah. Um, you know, I also want to acknowledge those listeners that are overextended and overwhelmed rolling their eyes right now because I get it and I empathize. And I want to just take a step back again to talk about what I'd mentioned earlier, Steve, which is conditioning. I talk a lot in my work about cultural conditioning. Yeah. You know, our conditioning is the way the world 
or the people that raise us have taught us to look at the world based upon how they see the world. You know, it doesn't actually make it true. But women, we have been deeply culturally conditioned to take care of others. And then, you know, if we have some time and energy, maybe we get around to ourselves. So there is often very subconsciously, it's not even verbalized, it's just in the DNA of our culture for women, there's a lot of guilt that goes with taking care of ourselves. You know, in fact, I always say this drives me nuts because my husband and I both have small businesses. We have two kids. And, um, you know, if I'm not like when the kids were younger, if I wasn't on the soccer field, there were women, you know, talking like, you know, if you're, if the wife's not there, the mother's not there, she's a bad mom. There's yeah. that, there's a belief almost like that. Right. When my husband, sh- so when I show up, nobody says anything. They're just like, Hey Jen, nice to see you. <laughs> not like way to go. You're amazing that yeah. you got here. Way to be here. Yes. Yeah. Right. But when my husband shows up, and he's got the kids. There's 10 women in my neighborhood that'll say, oh my God, Jen, you're so lucky. You have the most amazing house. He's amazing. I'm like, why is he amazing? Why is he amazing? Because he works and shows up for our kids. I work and show up for our kids. Why aren't we amazing? And why don't we love on each other as women and support each each other more? Yes. And so that's very much the culture that I've created in my community So, you know, women will say to me, you know, I came for your courses and the content's amazing and I'm transforming in all these positive ways. But the icing on the cake that I didn't expect was this experience of having community where women lift each other up. Now, again, you know, this is something I heard much more frequently back in the day when I started 21 years ago, because it's changing, thankfully. And when other women lift other women up, we can move mountains together and Um, So I just want to speak to those women, you know, it's normal to feel guilt. It's normal to feel like, why is it so hard? You know, because we're wired culturally and conditioned to take care of the kids and the house and the husband and the neighbor and everybody and then get to ourselves, you know, so it's a very typical thing to hear women say, oh, I didn't get to the gym today, you know, because I had to take care of the dog or this Mm -hmm. or that. Mm -hmm. But what I want to start with is understanding and letting your listeners hear today that when you put yourself first, when you make the choice, which it can be incredibly hard, it should be hard if you haven't done it, but when you make the choice to put yourself first, now not only are you gonna be a better version of you for you, so you're gonna be happier, but you're gonna be a better mother, a better coworker, a better leader for your team, a better neighbor, because you are going to be helping others today from a cup that's full versus from a well that's tapped dry. And that's often where women are are operating from a dry well, which is why you've got the angry mother yelling and you've got the woman in the boardroom, you know, uh, uh, like anxious and, and everything because we tend to serve everybody else and not ourselves. So long ago, I took the bold risk of of learning how to tend to Jen's needs first. And, you know, look, I even got some pushback. I mean, there were some friends like, oh, you know, Jen takes care of herself or Jen's so selfish because it's almost like we envy, you know, because it's like I I imagine I can't have that. Right. Yeah. But then then you put it down. Yeah. 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 Then I was a power of example for my friends. And they'd say, you know, I used to judge you that you used to go get a massage at the end of the week or this. But but now I'm doing it for myself. And I see I see I can be better for everybody around me. And I think, too, you know, I want to speak to people that are saying, oh, you know, I don't have the financial means to get a massage or I don't have a a minute in the day. Start small. Start small. You don't have to like, you know, go from zero to a thousand. Start with what can I do? What can I do? Well, I could honestly delegate one task off to my husband and ask him to pick up the kids. I could start there and I could give myself 30 extra minutes. What could I do with that? I could take a walk. Just move my body, be out in nature, get some sun. You know, I could start small, right? So start where you are to get where you'd like to be, you know? And and I always tell clients, if you try to aim to like slay all your dragons overnight, yeah, of course you're gonna quit in a yeah, week. Yeah. But if you aim today to do 1% better than you did yesterday, and you aim again tomorrow to do 1% better, 
think about that. It's like compounded interest in the stock market. That's not going to be 100% better at the end of the year. That's going to be 365% better. So these little wins on a daily basis really add up. And so these are all the reasons why having a coach, you know, it's, it's about loving ourselves, recognizing we have this one precious life. We do matter. And if I start loving myself, I'm going to set a new tone for everyone around me to respond to me differently because everything starts with us. You know, all our relationships, Steve, I always say to clients, start with our relationship with ourselves. So if you're hearing this today, you know, and on any level, this is resonating and you're like, yeah, my relationship with myself isn't great. Just ask yourself, where could I start? You know, what's the smallest thing? I could begin to do for myself, you know, and, and I also want to just say, because I, I keep it real for my clients too, you know, nobody ever has this all figured out and perfectly. I'm not sitting over here like, you know, Steve, I've mastered it all. Like, you know, even the last few years coming back to work full time, yeah. something had to give and it was my fitness. And I've always been very physically fit and take excellent care, but something had to give between the kids, the dog, the clients getting back to work. So this year I've really made that my top priority. That's my 1%, you know, that's the one thing where it has to happen for Jen, because I want to feel more energy. I want to serve people feeling more happy from a, from a well that's running over versus dry. So, you know, we all have these places and we all know what we need to start with. So, you know, as soon as that light goes off, just say, yeah, I could start there. And what's like, you know, can I five minutes, 10 minutes, anything is better than nothing. Yes. And, and, you know, I, I, last thing I'll just say around this, see, Steve, you're right. I'm so passionate. Like I joke when I come on a podcast, I could do a three hour podcast with you. Uh, And then you have to shut (laughs) up because I have so much to say, but, but I, I'm so passionate about, you know, I really do think you have this one precious life and most of us miss it. We miss that this is a gift to be here. There is so much suffering in the world and so much of it is unnecessary suffering. Um, And, uh, you know, so I'm so voracious to teach people how to see things differently and how to learn skills that can make your life easier better, happier, healthier. Um, so yeah, so we start where we are and then I'm going to leave it there because I don't even remember what the thing was. That I, was gonna... <laughs> I love it. It was great. <laughs> but uh, yes. The, yeah. the one thing I, I really want to go back to though, and I think it's really good to make sure that my audience really picks up on this is we often find ourselves focusing on the things that we can't do, right? So you're already starting from an attitude of lack, right? And sort of what you were saying is, It's like, I just, there's no way I can do these things or, you know, how great that is for you, but I can't, I don't have the time. I don't have the luxury of, you know, whatever. And the reality is that that's where you start, right? For that internal dialogue. What is that 1% that Jen's recommending I look at that I can do? And I guarantee you, you have it. And, you know, I always tell people, all you need to do is go to your phone and see how much time you spent on social media right? You know, there, there, you can find your 1% there, right? You can find a little bit of a five minute, 10 minute or whatever to go take that walk or to shave, you know, something a little bit differently in terms of how you invest your time by investing in rather than looking vicariously through other people's lives on social, figure out how to live vicariously through your own and find that 1%. Maybe it is, you know, getting up a, a little bit early and going to, you know, you know, going on that walk or doing some yoga or, you know, making the trip to the gym and you don't have to do it every day and you're not a failure if you don't do it every day. It's, yeah, I did it three times this week. I mean, that is solid. It's, it's like you coming to say, okay, I've reached this point in my life now that I realize this is the thing that I want to work on. That internal dialogue is so absolutely critical. And I feel like, and you, you, you um, hit the nail on the head is, you can't show up in any other aspect of your life until you're actually ready to work on this in here and be prepared to start improving there because then you're shortchanging everybody else, right? When you don't do it. And so I think that's such a huge point that you made. Yes. And thank you for what you just shared because you jogged my memory to what I was going to say, which is great, Steve. And it, it aligns with what you said. So, you know, I'll say to a client, so what's the goal? Well, I'd love to work out five days a week. Okay. 
that's awesome, but that's a lot, right? Yeah. If you're gonna, you're not working out at all. So what do you know without fail that you can do? And then there's a pause, right? Reflection. Yeah. Well, I know I could do at least two days a week. Great. So let's get it on the calendar and let's hit those two days a week. Because what happens when you hit the goal, even if it's smaller, right? Even if it's not the ideal goal yet, is you feel good about yourself. You're like, yay, I did it. And then guess what happens nine times out of 10? Because you're like, oh my God, I did it twice. I want to do it again. And usually clients come back and say, guess what? I did it three times this week. <laughs> yep, so it's, exactly. better to, it's better to set a smaller goal and then, and then end up doing better than the goal you set than to bite off too big a goal and fail right out of the gate and then yeah. feel unmotivated to keep even trying. Exactly. So, yeah. you know, you said something very similar. So thank you. Cause I think that's so important. Start with like the smallest goal, you know, met, I want to meditate. Well, that can be incredibly um, hard for people that haven't sat still and learned yet how to control their mind and, and shut, you know, press the off button. That's, yeah. You know, so you're not going to sit down and say, well, I'm going to go 30 minutes. You're going to crawl out of your skin. Right. Yep. But if you say, all right, I'm going to do three minutes, not even five. Like I'm going to do, you know, or I'm going to do 120 seconds and I'm just going to close my eyes and get still. And no matter, you know, what happens, no matter how much anxiety I feel, um, you know, the spirit, not the ego, the choice maker is going to say, we're just going to stay here despite the noise in your head, despite the feelings until the time is done. Yeah. And then, you know, you do maybe three times a week for three minutes and next week, maybe say, let me try three and a half minutes. You don't even have to go up to four, like baby steps. You know, there's a philosophy called Kaizen yeah. and it's very much the same, you know, as the, um, the, the 1% philosophy. Um, and it has a very, you know, interesting history and origin Kaizen, but I, I'm not going to go into that because I'll go off on a 20 minute tangent and Steve will be like, come on back, Jen. But uh, yeah, um, you know, it, it's just, it's a great way to really, you know, and if you look at highly successful people in our culture, you know, athletes, um, you know, people that are, you know, uh, successful in any field you'll see that they're consistent yep. with, and they're hyper-focused on one or two things in their life maximum. They're not juggling six different goals, yep. you know? And, and, and so, you know, it, it might feel like nothing, but, you know, starting with the smallest thing and doing your best to be as consistent as possible, trust me, it's like watering a little potted seed. It starts to grow yep. um, and you feel motivated and you feel momentum and you feel excited and you're able to mark progress, tangible progress and keep going. So I'm all about the small wins. I'm all about starting where you are. And, and yeah, I think the last thing, what kind of what you spoke about too, you have to start by getting still and yeah. getting silent. And that's often the power of a coach too, because you're blocking out time to say, you know, for the next 60 minutes, I'm just going to drown out all the noise in the world, everything around me. And I'm going to really tune into me. Where am I at? What do I need? What do I want? We always know the answer if we just have the willingness to get still and get yep. silent and listen. Yeah, I love that. I mean, you know, when you're talking about, um, you know, talking about this approach, it's it's about the practice. It's not about perfection. And what you'll find is I, I was thinking as you were talking about doing that one thing that you can look back on and you can say, look, I did that. I accomplished that. Um, you know, a couple of years ago during pandemic, uh, one of the shows on Netflix that just went crazy because we were all stuck at home was Marie Kondo's um, organization show. Right. And she was, you know, it's kind of, you know, fun to listen to her say, well, does this bring you joy? No, my sock drawer does not bring me joy, but organizing my sock drawer drawer did. And it was that activity. And if I can do it for this drawer, I can do it for the next drawer. And before you know it, I find um, that I have opportunity to be organized in multiple ways. Right. And I think the, the thing that it is, whether it is the gym two days a week and Hey, your, your stretch goal is three, right. But Two is where you, you can pat yourself on the back and say you did something. 
you know, whether it's, you know, going to the gym, whether it's finding that, you know, few minutes for yourself. Um, I did a video this morning, actually, um, uh, talking about, you know, uh, I'm enough, right. You know, at the end of the day, even just coming back into your core center and reminding yourself that you are enough, you will, everything is figure outable. Everything that you are dealing with in terms of stress, we, we all have it. We all have to deal with these things. But at the end of the day, if you can just remind yourself that you are strong enough and you're capable enough and you are enough, it's amazing how just even 30 seconds of doing that, that self-affirmation can really alter how you view your day, how you respond to that next call, how you look back at your day at the end of the day. I always tell my Ripple audience, you know, the way that if you could go out and make a difference every single day, just do set an intention to make a difference one time, right? But as you lay your head on your pillow at the end of the day and you go back through your day and you say, did I make a difference? And you find that one, not only is it just this amazing feeling of, of you know, wow, I accomplished that, that gratitude, but all the other things that it brings is, I, like you said, if I can do one, maybe tomorrow I could do two. And I think that's such a powerful reminder for, for all of us, right? You know, that you don't have to go, you know, eat the elephant in one meal. It is small little bites. And over the course of 365 days, that's 365% better than you were last year. That's a lot. Yeah. You said so many things. Um, Just to go back, you know, you're, when you said I'm enough, there's this great Louise Hay quote that she always used and shared, uh, you know, that I, I started to follow Louise Hay back in, I think, 1990. And it was, I am enough. I have enough. I do enough. Oh, I and love that. I find myself going back to that. And, you know, that goes again to cultural conditioning, mm. Steve. So we live in a world and it's harder than ever because there's so much information coming to us all the time yeah. from every direction today. So it is more challenging than ever to drown that out. But we live in a time and in a society and a culture where we have been taught and trained and conditioned again to measure our worth yeah. and our value by how busy we are, right? How productive we are. And so I often find today, you know, the, t the, the common uh, chit chat, you know, when you run into someone at the supermarket or the, the football field with your kids or whatever it is, is, hey, how are you? Oh my God, I'm great. I'm just busy. I'm so busy. I'm so busy. You know, and it's like, and, and I think that's one of the gifts the pandemic gave us is it was like a hard stop for everyone globally to have to sit still and, and start to deal with our feelings. And, yeah. and so, you know, just for your listeners today, again, if it's helpful to anyone listening, I want to assure you that you are enough and you have enough and you do enough right now. And you do not need to measure your value, your intrinsic value by what you are going to do today, yeah. you know, yeah. and, and busier does not equal better. It does not equal more and it certainly doesn't equal happiness. Um, you know, one of the gifts of starting my business and having grown it in New York City is, you know, it's a city of movers and shakers and very quote unquote successful people, right? By yeah, society's yeah. standards again. Well, I learned very early on having clients that had the dream job, had the income, you know, I would see often their unhappiness. And and that was such a good lesson for me to recognize that what the world tells us is going to equate happiness does not always equate happiness. No. So no. even more important, I think for all of us is to have the courage to create a space each day until we're clear to drown out all that noise, to learn how to tune in and listen to the inner voice and to say, you know, you know, Joseph Campbell said, follow your bliss, right? Ask yourself, what is my bliss? Even yeah. if the world even if the world doesn't label that bliss, you know, have the courage to be you and do you. And, and this is something I think on a, on a lot of levels, people would say I'm very good at. And then if I'm being, you know, brutally honest, Steve, I'd say this is something I'm still challenged by. Me too. Um, yep. Yeah, because I really think in a lot of ways I am genuinely happy with my life and my career as it is. But one of the things people are always pushing me to do, and you know, listen, 
you know, you reached out and said, the world needs to know, more people need to know what you do. You're right. I want to serve more people. I want to help more people. Um, at the same time, if I'm being true to Jen Mack, there is a part of me that I don't have the desire to be famous or known. I have the desire to serve my clients and help people. So I, I struggle a little bit with that, mm -hmm. you know, I struggle a little bit with the brutality of the world sometimes and the harshness, uh, you know, whether it's on social media or any of that. So, uh, you know, so what I'm sharing is I struggle too with this, but it's having the courage a day at a time to just keep putting one foot in front of the other and, and be true to yourself and trust that whatever you're feeling called to, whatever feels good and right to you, that's right where you're supposed to be. Yeah. Uh, what a great, great reminder. I think we absolutely could go three hours and then some, because I just love hearing you talk and I learned so much. We are, uh, I'm going to have to have you back for sure for a follow-up sequel for this, but you know, I want to be respectful of your time. I know you have clients to see today and, and, and I certainly appreciate the time that you've given me. And uh, I know my audience is going to just fall in love with you. So um, that's a foregone conclusion, but I always like to kind of end these um, interviews with a few ripple connection questions. And what I often find is these, um, what I call ripple connection question is a little bit of insight as to who you are as an individual and just, you know, kind of get a, a little bit further insight as to who Jen is as the person. And oftentimes it's these things that we hear that are often the connection points that actually start us off and down the road of, of, uh, uh, having a dialogue, a connection, you know, that we can resonate and say, Hey, in that inter or in that uh, interview, you shared this one thing and I could really resonate with it. So are you, are you game for a few uh, questions? Sure, sure. All right. I'm What's the best thing in your mind about being an entrepreneur? I think the best thing in my mind about being an entrepreneur is the freedom to create everything as it feels best and good to me, because I know if it feels right and good to me, I'm going to bring my best self to my clients and then I'm going to give them the best that I have. So, yeah, that's good. That's a great answer. What's the hardest thing about being an entrepreneur? Oh God, where do I start? Steve? Oh my God. I mean, it's not for the faint at heart. That's right. for sure. Um, what's and you and your first? husband are both doing it. So I mean, <laughs> this is... we're like insane. We didn't really think that one through, uh, especially after we had the kids, we were like, this might've been the craziest thing. Um, the hardest thing I think is, I don't know. I think, um, just, I, I don't know. There's been so many challenges for me, if I'm honest, the last few years, like, cause I was, you know, a brick and mortar in Manhattan for so many years. And then I really had to find my way to like fully being online, which I yeah. don't think was as comfortable a place for me. So I think it's just been endless, like how to manage, you know, people on my team and, and also, you know, do that in a, in a supportive, positive way, and then also show up for my clients in the best way. And then my kids, I think the juggle is probably the hardest thing yeah. for me. Yeah. Um, but you know, there, there are a lot of challenges and I think any honest entrepreneur would, would tell you, but I feel ultimately at the end of the day, it's all worth it. And it's definitely my path. And I think if you follow who you are in your path, you know, you'll always be as happy as you can be. Nothing is going to be perfect. Absolutely. Um, but that's yeah, a, that's a great answer for sure. What did the eight-year-old Jen want to be when she grew up? The eight-year-old Jen wanted to be a professional dancer, oh. um, which, which I did do for a short stint after NYU. But I ultimately realized that I think that eight-year-old wanted to do that because she loved her mom and her mom had always wished she was a dancer. Uh. And I think, I think truthfully, Jen is right where she should be doing what she really wants to be. So, I love um, that. And I still like to dance. I can cut up the rug pretty well when we go out or to a wedding. I, I enjoy dancing. It's fun. Oh, uh, that's awesome. Well, you're, you're obviously on the path you were destined to be, but if you were to make a career change and do anything that you could possibly do, what would you most like to try? Oh my gosh, Steve, that's a, <laughs> I don't often get stumped, but you know, I don't know if this is going to sound like a cop out, but I'm being honest. I don't think I want to try anything else. I really, that's awesome. 
feel like God put me on this planet to do exactly what I'm doing. And I am just grateful. I'm wired and I'm hungry to grow every day. So I feel like it never ends, you know, and I'm always learning and there's always something new I can share with clients. And I just feel very grateful for that. Um, you know, so yeah. And I don't, I don't, I don't think there's anything else I'd really be happy doing. I don't that's, know. That's a beautiful answer. I mean, that, but if it's uh, this, I'll let you know. I have to give that <laughs> some deep thought now. Deal. Fantastic. So what is the one thing you wish everybody knew? The one thing I wish everybody knew is that you're deeply loved. And if no one has told you today, um, I want to be the person to tell you that you are deeply loved and valued and cherished and that you matter. You mm. really do matter and that you're here for a reason and maybe many reasons, even if you can't see them in this moment. Oh, that's fantastic. When, uh, you know, you and I talked a little bit about this, you know, um, you know, we both have, um, characteristics, characteristics of being extroverted, but you know, we probably are more introverted. So how do you find, cause I'm always curious for people that are like me, how do you, um, how do you sort of unwind and recharge? I go into my hole, Steve, <laughs> my husband, my husband knows. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I love people. I think yeah. just like, you, I love connecting with people. I love learning their story. I love helping people. I love it. And it charges me for the time being. It energizes me, but then my battery definitely goes on empty. So I go into my, I, I love my bed. I have yeah. a bed. I have a chaise uh, chair in, uh, in our bedroom too. And in fact, right over our bed, there's a sign I bought many years ago on a vacation. I found that says, this is my happy place. And it really is. <laughs> <laughs> and I get my weighted blankie and I either read a good book or I, you know, like, uh, you know, numb out, so to speak, on Netflix, watching a really good, like, suspense. Um, but that's kind of how I recharge my batteries. Or I might call, you know, I have like a very small inner circle of dear friends and I might call and just chit chat with them. But uh, yeah, I like to dial it all the way back and. I yeah, it. I love being in my cozy bed and just having downtime. You know, that's perfect. Yeah, that, that's a great answer, and and uh, I need to I need to get one of those signs as well. I think so. <laughs> um, you know, th this question is always kind of a fun one to to ask because it really gives some insight as to you know what you really want you know people to perceive about you. But what is the best thing you could hear a family member, colleague, or client say about? Jen Mack? Mm. Well, I guess the best thing, God, these are good questions. Um, <laughs> you know, I don't know, I, I don't know that, that, um, you know, that Jen's human like the rest of us, but I applaud that she always gives her all. She always strives to do her best and that I know her intentions are always pure, even uh -huh. if they might miss the mark. Yeah, that's a great answer. Fantastic. I, 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 I can hear people saying that about you for sure, without question. What, in your opinion, does the ripple effect mean to you? The ripple effect. This is why I was so excited. It's actually on my website, on my homepage. I, I thought this is such a synchronicity when you yeah. reached out. Um, I feel strongly deep into my heart and my bones and my gut that we are so much better, Steve than what the world reflects back to us right now. Mm -hmm. And I, um, I feel so strongly that, you know, if each of us did our own work to heal wherever we're wounded, to become the best version of ourselves that we could, and we brought that out into the world, there would be peace. There would yeah. be no hunger. There would be no war. Um, you know, it goes back to Mother Teresa. She said, you know, you want to, change the world, go home and love your family, like start yeah. under your own roof. Um, so yeah, that's great. I love that. What ripple can I create for you? Oh, sorry. I didn't finish the ripple. Sorry. <laughs> the question. You were like, what's the ripple? So the ripple effect would be 
if you become your best self, you you take that out into the world. Was that clear? Yeah, Sorry. Yeah, that was clear. Yeah, I got that from there. I what ripple can you create for me? Um, you know, I, I think just I always have faith that everything is happening for a reason. Like there was a reason we connected. There's a reason we're here together today. And even if it's one person listening that needed to hear this today, what you could do for me is if somebody feels like something resonated, you can check out my work. Um, I love helping women transform their lives. I love seeing a woman come to me in one state and leave in three, six, nine months, 12 months later saying my life has changed in ways I couldn't have fathomed. Thank you. So um, yeah, you can um, check out my website. It's jen-mac.com, J-E-N-M-A-C.com. And I think that's that's the ripple, Steve, if yeah. there's somebody that needs what I do in the way I do it. Well, I, you make it easy to promote you because you are, are phenomenal at what you're doing. I, can, uh, I, I would have absolutely no problem referring people to you. And along that lines, I mean, definitely uh, we will put your website on the uh, show notes, but how else might you like people to follow you? Um, you know, you and I connected on Twitter or X or whatever the hell we're calling it today. <laughs> well, I'm laughing about that. How else would I like people to yeah. connect with me? Well, if I'm being brutally honest, I, I'm old school. I'm old fashioned. I like eye to eye contact. Yep. You know, back in the day when I used to teach in person, every class I would hug every client. I love, I love that. You know, they, they, we need eight hugs a day scientifically to maintain <laughs> a plateau or something. You know, our, our normal, not our plateau, our normal uh, a, a level of maintenance of health and, and happiness and well being. But um, yeah, I, I guess social media works too. I'm not the biggest social media person, but I'm on there because I I want to help people. I want to spread, like you said, my positivity. So I am on Instagram. I am on Facebook. I am on Twitter or X, formerly known as Twitter. Uh, and um, I am on LinkedIn. And my handle is at Jen Mac Gill, J-E-N-M-A-C-G-I-L. Um, you can always reach out to me there. I love connecting with um, amazing people everywhere around our globe. So thank absolutely. you, Steve. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I would ask my audience, if you do reach out to Jen uh, on any of those platforms, let her know that you heard this amazing interview and uh, that you really took something from it. Because uh, one of the best connection points you could have is, Jen, I heard you say this on the Ripple Effect. You know, what a great way to start the conversation. Guys, we'll be back again with another new episode of the Ripple Effect podcast very soon. But until then, Jen, thank you so much and ripple on. Thank you, Steve. And thank you for all the good work you do. It's been really a pleasure to, to be here with you today. Uh, I appreciate thank you. I appreciate that so much. We will, we will definitely speak soon. <laughs>